Right, thank you for coming. Uh, my name's Ed. I sit on the tech leadership team for VMware um, here in Europe, joined by my colleague Matt. Uh, Matthew Steiner, I'm cloud technologist for Europe, Middle East and Africa, working for our cloud management business unit. And we're going to cover two areas. Um, firstly, why VMware, uh, why we believe VMware is a platform to run all the things. Um, and then Matt's going to tell you a little bit around what's going to be needed to manage all the things on the platform to run all the things. Be lots all of things, things. Lots of things. All about, about the things. Um, I'm going to start a little bit um, talking about how innovation happens. Because it's the understanding of how innovation happens that means you can figure out why you need one platform to run all the things. Uh, who here has an idea as to how people innovate in IT? And is it called bimodal? Who, who's familiar with bimodal IT? Anyone? Anyone? Yeah, who so thinks it's a good idea? Who thinks it's a good idea? Far fewer hands. Yeah, so bimodal Gartner. IT is great. Bimodal IT is, is Gartner's model um, by which innovation allegedly happens within the IT industry. Um, it's quite a simple model. Uh, you have what's called mode one IT, uh, which is all the old stuff. And then there's a suggestion that you build the mode two IT. Uh, that's all the new stuff. And then over time, what you'll do is turn off the mode one stuff and use the mode two stuff. Um, it's quite a simple model. And uh, I dare say in about two years' time, we'll soon have mode three IT. And the suggestion there will be that you turn off the mode two IT. And Gartner probably has about three to four years of this left before I think people caught on, on and, and figure out what's happening. The truth is, that's not how innovation happens. Right? It's not how innovation happens in society. Uh, it's certainly not how innovation happens within organizations. Innovation happens like this. This model of pioneers, settlers, and town planners. If you're familiar with um, a friend of mine, Simon Wardley, then you've heard him talk about this stuff. But it's a really good way of describing how innovation happens, both in society and also within the IT organizations that so many of us work in. You see, what we actually need in life is pioneers. And the best example I can give of the pioneer is the cowboy that opened up the Wild West. Right? They uh, had a single goal, and that goal was to get the gold. Uh, they were very objective focused, they didn't care who got in their way. Uh, in fact, if you got in their way, you probably got shot. Uh, that's what mostly happened to the native Indians, lots of shooting. Uh, cowboys go and get the gold, very happy. You can spot the pioneers in your IT organizations. They're the people that don't care about the rules, they don't care about the governance, they don't care about the process you put in place. They just have a clear goal, which is to achieve their aim of whatever needs to be done for Friday, and to hell with everything else. Now, what's interesting is if you look at the West, what happened after that was a different group of people arrived. They were the settlers. And they came into the land that had been cleared by the pioneers, where all the native Indians had been shot. Um, and they built the first frontier towns. They built the first settlements. Governance arrived, literally, in the form of the sheriff. Right? Think of every Western program, every Western film you've ever seen. The sheriff turns up in town. Now I have some governance, some structure, some control. There's a different set of skills required to build those first frontier towns than run around on horseback shooting people that don't agree with you. And then finally, you have another group of people called the town planners. And the town planners take that settlement, that small frontier town, and they turn that frontier town into Las Vegas. They turn the port into San Francisco. And that's another set of skills. They're building things at scale. They're building things that require huge process and governance and control. So you've got this, this, this transition from pioneering things, behind that comes a team of settlers, and behind them come a team of what we call town planners. And that's how innovation happens. That's how societal innovation happens. That's how we move on in society. And eventually what happens is those things that the town planners have built at scale, a new team of pioneers turn up and go, wow, that's a really cool thing that you've built. I can do something pioneering with that. So the example that I use in the, in the Wild West thing is, is where did the, 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 the cowboys, where did they get the guns from? They got the guns from the gun factory that the town planners had built because some crazy pioneer came up with the idea of the gun five years before it. And so they went and built a gun factory. So all the best analogies, to make this clearer, um, in IT are either car-related or Lego-related. Uh, it's your lucky day today. We're going to use Lego. Um, and so the analogy works like this. You will find a pioneer in your organization if they are the people who are most likely to build a partially working 3D printer out of Lego. It won't work very well, some bits will fall off it, it won't always deliver the goods, but it'll prove the concept and it will be good enough. The settlers come in behind and they take it, they document it, they understand what's needed to build that at scale, they productize it, they figure out what's needed to go into the 3D printer Lego set, and they turn up to the R&D within Lego and go, there's the next thing that we should be making at scale. 
Town planners, they come in, they tool up the Lego factory to build the productized Lego 3D printer at scale and get it onto the shelves. The pioneer in this cycle takes the 3D model Lego set and says, wow, I can buy 3D printers at a price point I could never buy them before. I can do different stuff now with 3D printers I couldn't do. I can get them into new markets that I couldn't get them into before. So a question on that basis, is someone like Amazon a pioneer? Are Amazon pioneering? No. Amazon are town planners. They're the ultimate SimCity players. They take, they take stuff that exists and make it freely available at scale. They make it available as a platform. So that's how innovation happens. The problem is, when we go and talk about innovation, digital transformation, moving to cloud, so often we end up with a CIO that has a strategy around this. So anyone's company they work for have a cloud strategy. Yes. Most cloud strategies work like this. Um, they say, right, uh, today we have, actually, let's call this out. What, what percentage of people's workloads are running on-prem? This works better when there's a room full of people. 80% um, perhaps, that's, that's roughly from doing all these presentations I've ever done, about 80% on-prem. Um, if I then say how much is running in the public cloud, maybe 10%, and how much is sitting in a hybrid model, maybe like another 10%. Most people's estates look like this today. And so a CIO comes in, joins the company, and says, we're going to the cloud. And for them, that usually means this, that in three years' time, I want to have less private stuff, I want to have more public stuff, and ideally, I want to have more hybrid stuff that sits between the two. And so that's going to be the focus of the journey that I'm going to take the company on. Except it doesn't really work very well, because that's actually not what's important. What's important is actually helping people build the applications. Right, I have to help people get around that cycle fast, the pioneer settlers town planner cycle. The quicker I can get something from being pioneering to being industrialized in my organization, the quicker I can make it productive for the business. The quicker I can go from the homebrew Kubernetes bits to having an industrialized Kubernetes platform my whole company can use, the better it is for my business. And so actually, this is a far more interesting way of looking at that moving to cloud conversation is actually, how do I need to build my applications of the future? Because what I've actually got is I've got a team of apps people asking, how should I build this new thing I'm being asked to build by the business and, and why? And an infrastructure team going, where should we run it? How should we run it? And how do we keep it portable? So this is then a far more interesting conversation to have with any IT organization around what's important for you today. So again, based on all the straw polls of ever doing this presentation, roughly today, about 10% about still on physical hardware. Some of that stuff just won't go away. Keeps Dell very happy. Um, then after that, um, you've got a percentage on VMs, so using um, virtual machines as an abstraction, probably about 70% roughly works out for today's numbers. Uh, using containers, so unstructured containers, so basically Docker hosts, about 5%. Um, I've done a, 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 this presentation loads of times, um, and uh, if I ask a room of 100 people how many people are using containers um, in their estates today, usually about 50 hands go up out of the 100. If I then say how many people are using containers in production to run mission-critical workloads, there's usually about four hands left in the air at that point in time. What we learn from this is that containers are largely like teenage sex. Um, lots of people talking about it, far fewer people actually doing it. But what you are seeing is a very rapid growth in, in, in that, that, that trend going forward. Uh, today, people are using containers as a service, something like Kubernetes, again, very low. Um, Platform as a service, a cloud foundry, really low as an average in terms of people actually running production workloads. Function as a service, people running production functions. Most people can't spell it, don't understand what it's there for, or don't understand the use case. And then the one everyone forgets about, because when I do this workshop with a customer and I say, tell me what percentage of your, um, your IT estate or workloads are running as SaaS, they go, oh, very little, hardly anything. Then they forget about Office 365 or as it's been renamed last week, Office 364, Three. um, because there's always a bigger slice of that than people, people think. And then you can have the question with the developers and the apps teams, what's going to import, be important for you in three years' time? And this gives you a much better idea of what that future state looks like. So there's still going to be some hardware. Dell half as happy. Um, VMs, big reduction in the number of VMs used as an abstraction layer. Guy from Dell live tweeting at Michael now. Please sack Ed. Uh, Unstructured containerized workloads. Um, well, my guess was Docker was going to disappear. Uh, it turns out in the news in the last month of Docker uh, getting rid of their enterprise business, that was a fairly accurate prediction. Um, but a big growth in people using containers as a service. Why is that not bigger? 
because I think most people in three years' time are going to have jumped to being far more interested in platform as a service, as a way of running things, be that a Cloud Foundry, uh, be that an OpenShift. Um, small increase in function, it's going to be niche. Um, the example I give of why you'd want function as a service is imagine the boarding pass scanners at an airport, right? There's hundreds of them through the airport and a massive infrastructure sitting behind them that looks after making sure that Matt is the right person with the right boarding pass on the right plane. But the majority of the day, for every hour, that scanner sits there doing nothing. And then for five minutes of consolidated time, it's going beep, 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 as everyone goes through. Wouldn't it be great if I only paid for the compute that was behind that process every time I executed the function to validate a boarding pass? It would mean for the rest of the hour, when nothing was happening, I wouldn't have to pay for any infrastructure to run that service. And then we have to assume that Microsoft have fixed Office 364. More people want to use it, um, and so the amount of SaaS goes up. So that's what you see when you start to understand what this cycle of innovation needs. It needs the ability not to think of cloud as a place, as somewhere to go and run something, but you need to understand what are the abstractions that I'm going to have to run so my pioneers can do their cool stuff, so that my settlers can do their cool stuff, and my town planners can industrialize. It's back in that Amazon example. If Amazon are the town planners, then the Netflix are the pioneer. They're taking the stuff the town planners have industrialized and building new services with it. So in order to do that, um, I'm just going to skip past this because that's a boring slide. In order to do that, what you need is one platform to run all the things. It becomes very apparent when you try and talk to companies about IT, the biggest thing that they've got that's getting in the way of them innovating today and getting around that cycle fast is silos. Because we're really good at building silos in IT. We define our, our self-value, we define our self-worth, we define our role. I can get certified in my silo. I'm a network person. I live in my network silo. I can advance through various qualifications of my network silo. It defines who I am and where I am in my career. Well, what you need is one platform to run all the things. And actually, most people have already got it. It's called VMware. I'm going to explain why. Today, most people have traditional three-tier monolithic applications. Right? It's the stuff that everyone wants to get rid of, made sense to get at the time, and it all expects to have a highly resilient infrastructure layer underneath it. Right? When people are writing these applications, no one's considering for a second today they're not going to sit on a virtualized infrastructure. I don't want to be the Veritas cluster server sales manager for Europe at the moment. I don't think they're selling a huge amount of Veritas cluster. I think people are expecting highly resilient infrastructure to live underneath their platforms. Now, what happens over time is the business comes and points at IT, and they say, hey, look, you really suck. Um, you don't get the stuff fast enough. It takes too long to procure stuff. It takes too long to deploy VMs. You're holding back the business. And so a huge focus of what we've been doing in IT over the last 10 years has been around automation. Right? How do we automate so we get things faster, repeatable with less errors? And if I was here five years ago, maybe eight years ago, I'd now do a fantastic section of this presentation where I talk to you about the revolutionary thing called OpenStack that's going to transform how we're all consuming our IT. Um, if the VMs and the IaaS was like a prefix menu in a French restaurant where I can have anything I want as long as it's on the menu, OpenStack's like an open buffet, and the developers can just come and scoop all the sausage rolls off when they want to. It's about reducing the friction to the consumption of IT. Now, what's interesting is that we're not here talking around how OpenStax revolutionized the world. And there's a really simple reason for that. Great news for us, it turns out IT wasn't actually the problem. The problem is as applications evolve, you can't innovate fast enough on the three-tier monolithic thing. You've got to find a way of breaking it down. So the only way to drive up the rate of change in IT is to drive down the cost, risk, and size of change. And that's effectively driven us to this model where we've started deploying microservices. That's all a microservice is. We're identifying the bit of the big app that has some real value to us as a business and breaking that up into smaller components that we can innovate on separately. So if I'm a bank, it might be um, part of my loyalty scheme. If I'm, a, if I'm a hotel, it could be the thing that says, hey, other people who stayed in this hotel really like this one. Have you considered staying there? If I'm an airline, my, my revenue management system makes sure that Matt always spends the most for every ticket that that airline can squeeze out of him. Now, these tend to be developer-written apps, right? If the, the traditional stuff is, is monolithic commercial off-the-shelf software, this stuff tends to be the stuff developers are building. And guess what? It turns out developers don't really like OpenStack. Why? Because it just gives them a VM by another means. And they don't really care about VMs. VMs don't help them achieve their goals. Developers want to be able to write and publish code. What developers want is an API for code. So along comes, bless them, Docker, 
um, who take some functionality in Linux and go, I can expose this functionality in a new way to give you the ability to run these fragments of code as containers. And so the container movement was born, and then more and more people moved to microservices, and people start to develop truly cloud-native applications. So apps that don't have one foot in the past, but applications that were built natively in the cloud. Now, doing containers at scale is quite difficult, it turns out. And so it would be really helpful if the open source industry came up with a simple way of running containers at scale. And so Kubernetes gets born, or containers as a service. So now I can run containers at scale as a distributed app. Most developers, and I've got some sample developers down here at the front, they're quite lazy. And so still with containers, they have a lot of heavy lifting to do they'd rather not get involved in. He's putting his hoodie on in the hope no one will spot him now. Um, so they quickly realized it would be far more useful to use a platform as a service. Right? So containers and Kubernetes is great, but actually I'd far rather code on top of a platform. It makes my life easier, my code is more portable, and I don't have to worry about the containers. So next up comes platform as a service. And then finally, the last step of this evolution at the moment is people talking about function as a service. So now you've got this evolution of application architecture from the monolithic to cloud native. And evolving with that, you've got the way that you're abstracting compute network and storage and delivering it to that application. The first abstraction is the VM. Then we go to an IaaS abstraction like OpenStack. Then containers become the abstraction before containers at scale becomes the way we want to consume it. Then we start talking about platform as a service, and we layer these abstractions on. Now, when I talk to customers about how they're doing this, the answer is I'm building silos for everything. They'll go, we've got a great relationship with UVMware, thank you very much. Um, we're, all our legacy stuff's running on your VMware stack. Um, for OpenStack, we've gone to uh, Mirantis, stroke Ubuntu, stroke Red Hat. They're building as a DevOps platform on OpenStack. Uh, containers, we've got three engineering teams doing containers. Uh, they're all interested in doing containers on bare metal. That's because we're insane. Um, and we've forgotten all the solved problems that virtualization fixed. Or the team that's doing the, doing the container project is too young to remember all the problems that virtualization fixed. And therefore, they've forgotten about it. So we're doing containers on bare metal. Uh, we're doing Kubernetes using OpenShift. Uh, again, Red Hat's helping us there. Or we're going to roll our own. After all, how hard can that be? Um, most dangerous phrase in, in IT. It's just engineering time. So you end up with a silo for containers, a silo for, for, for FAS, and no one's got a clue what they're doing in, 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 in the function space. So you can step back at this point and you present this to a CIO, and you go, you've literally built six silos of IT just because you want to consume those six silos in a different way. That's insane. Why would you do that? That's like going back to the old days where I had to buy a particular color server to run a particular vendor's database. Right? That's not a good way of scaling my IT. Why are you doing it? And they go, well, because that's how it's done. That's what my engineering team said. The people that don't remember virtualization, they said that's how it's done. We go, well, what if there was a better way? What if there was one platform to run all the things? Would, would that have some use to you? At this point, the CIO's eyes light up. And they're like, well, yes, of course. That's, that'd be panacea. It's exactly what I want. One platform to run all the things would be great. And I go, well, if you, you, you bought it. Software-defined data center, right? It's the platform to run all the things. It does, it does all of this. You've already invested it for the VMs. Why would you not use it to run the other bits? And so when you build this out, what you realize is that you can take, oops, I'm building the slide out too soon. You can take this software-defined data center, and I can expose it as VMs. I can use vRealize to orchestrate how that gets deployed. If I want to, I can use VMware Integrated OpenStack, and I can deploy that SDDC through the constructs of OpenStack if I really want to, popular in, in, in telco and NFE. Feast for integrated containers allows me to provision that out as container workloads, as Docker hosts, as single containers. VMware Kubernetes allows me to deploy that as a Kubernetes play. I can manage it with the announcements around things like Tantu Mission Control. The upcoming acquisition, should it close a Pivotal, brings Pivotal back into the VMware family. Suddenly I have a way of running platform as a service on this. But you know what, if you don't want that, we've got a partnership with Red Hat. We'll help you land Red Hat OpenShift on top of the SDDC. And there's a whole range of function services you can run, ranging from OpenFAS, where people are using it, through to oh, Pivotal Function Service. All of those abstractions are available out of the box on the SDDC. They don't have to be silos. Now, if I was presenting this slide 15 years ago, what I'd now do is I'd say, and the great news is that this architecture can sit on top of any of your servers. They can be Dell servers, they can be Supermicro servers, they could be Gateway 2000 servers. Do you remember them with the little cows on the boxes? Um, Nothing's changed, by the way, except where we're going to get the servers from. All that's changed is where the compute network and storage 
that we're going to abstract, pool, and automate comes from? It comes from the clouds. So it could come from your on-prem servers. It could come from AWS. It could come from Oracle Cloud. It could come from Google Cloud. It could come from Azure. It could come from can't read yeah. IBM Cloud. Any of 4,500 cloud-verified partners. And if you live on that side of the planet, it could come from Alibaba's cloud. We can deploy the SDDC just as you've got it on-prem on any of these clouds. So suddenly, rather than thinking of cloud as a place, we've made cloud become a platform. And what that really means is that I've got the choice of where I run these workloads. So think about it. I've got a complete portfolio of services and products now on which I can build a complete hybrid story. And now I've got one platform to run all the things across the clouds. And what that means is it frees me up to make decisions around where I run those workloads based on the native cloud services. I suddenly have one layer that spans all of these clouds with consistent operations and consistent management that I can move workloads between using vMotion. And so now if I want to use something like Amazon Lambda, I can just deploy my VMs into an SDDC sitting inside Amazon and consume Amazon native services. If I want to use Oracle's ERP services, I can deploy some of the VMs into that estate. If I want to use Azure's natural language speech processing services, I can just deploy some VMs into the SDDC that sits in Azure. We've moved a long way on from where we were when we talked about a virtualization story that spanned across servers. But the focus for VMware now and moving forwards is this. It's how do we turn cloud from a place into a platform? And how do we ensure that when you're trying to run your workloads, we just give you one platform to run all the things? That's a great story. What it also needs is a simple strategy for how you manage it. And that's how you manage all the things. And at that point, I'll hand over to Matt. Thanks, Ed. Um, so that's platform or infrastructure platform solved. That's great. Um, so what I've been doing um, around a lot of the VMUGs is talk about platform engineering because what Ed's described is um, a lot of what used to be our bread and butter. We used to spend a lot of time as, as engineers or, or um, architects building infrastructure platforms. And I now largely see that as a, as a, as a largely solved problem. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, really where I see a lot of the, the energies um, from our customers are around the services that you're going to deploy on those platforms, the things that Ed talked about, the things that sit on those infrastructure, um, on, on, and it's the applications themselves that consume those things that sit on the infrastructure, or the services, as you see them in the middle. So if I de deconstruct this just a little bit more, um, did anyone bring any rocks into the room? Uh, no? Oh, I'm safe. Good, because it's usually at this point I get rocks thrown at me. Um, because I have a narrative um, that talks about the infrastructure. This is the one platform to run all the things up there. And I've, I've changed the words, but I usually say infrastructure, solved problem. And then people think, it's not solved, and they start throwing rocks at me. Um, so actually, I've changed my narrative a little bit to it's a largely solved problem. But what Ed talks about, that one platform to run all the things, it is a largely solved platform. Does anyone here really still get excited about how many network cards I'm putting into my servers? Uh, well, um, Stockham does, it's because he sells servers and network cards. Um, but the reality is we don't get excited so much about what color cables we use and, and, and how we configure our servers. Our servers are often very much pre-engineered solutions. All that stuff's been largely solved. What the platform engineer should now be concerned about are the services that we're running on this infrastructure. Because the most important things, um, going right to the top of um, Ed's presentation, is the innovation. Innovation leads to applications, and applications require services to run on or to run in. So I believe the platform engineer of the future, you guys out there, you should be getting really interested about how can I enable my sold infrastructure problem to deliver the services that my consumers really, really, really want to um, deliver. And this is where cloud management comes in. The cloud management software is the software that you use to do the four Cs, curate, Sorry, create, curate, control, and actually consume, which is the fourth C in there. So it's cloud management software that brings infrastructure to life. And I'm going to talk about these um, in turn, because really think about it as infrastructure solve problem. How can I make the services appear on my environment? 
Now, before I go into the four C's, create, curate, consume, control, talk a little bit about what cloud management software is and how it plays. Because there's two different ways you can look at cloud management software. You look at, well, I, I tend to see customers looking at it in two different ways. The first way is from the public, which side is that? Kind of right there, private cloud in. Know your space, Matthew, you know what you're presenting. So the private cloud inside. So this is where I've got, I'm building a private cloud, I want to instantiate services, and I want to start running my private cloud as a real cloud, not just some infrastructure. So there's some things that you need to do. The first thing you need to do is get your house in order. Start to operate your cloud, like Amazon and Azure and Alibaba and Oracle, operate their public cloud. Start to automate a lot of the operations you do. Do. Start to think about capacity as capacity on demand, just in time capacity on demand. Start to really operate in a very, very cloudy way. So, because what's going to happen in most, with most successful private clouds is the number of workloads that those private clouds are going to support, they're going to exponentially rise. Just to give you a picture of what we do in my business unit, in my business unit um, we have um, about 1,000 developers. Those 1,000 developers create 1.2 million virtual machines per week. 1.2 million virtual machines per week. And we do not have an ever-increasing number of um, admins looking after those virtual machines. What we've done is we've created a highly automated platform that allows them to operate at that sort of scale without having to worry about it. We got our house in order, and we started to run our platform like a proper cloud. The second thing you need to do is apply automation, quite obviously. Um, automation comes in, and I see there are two um, channels for automation now, two, as Americans would say, two swim lanes when it comes to automation. The first one is a very traditional swim lane, and we're probably very comfortable with, with it. We used to call it IT, well, we still do call it IT automating IT. Um, it's something where we take the process of building servers, typically virtual machines, and we completely automate that end-to-end -end process, so that when IT is asked for a service, a virtual machine, the process of delivering that virtual machine is completely, is completely automated, and it no longer takes however many weeks or months it can often take in an organization to get the virtual machine fully configured, set up with IPAM, set up with CMDB, et cetera, et cetera, all the things you need to do in your enterprise. And that's a common swim lane number one. That rapidly moves to swim lane number two. Swim lane number two is when I move into modern application development, and I start leveraging that capability, and I start calling on those automation processes on a much more um, regular basis or much more frequently. So instead of a traditional IT automating IT where I'm standing stuff up every day, you know, a bunch of machines here, a bunch of machines there, we get into a situation where DevOps processes are calling the IT automation and standing up dozens, tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of virtual machines or systems per day and then destroying them. So automation becomes very important. Now, as you make automation available to people, you need governance as well. Now, it would be no good in my business unit if we stood 1.2 million virtual machines up every, every week and didn't destroy any. We'd soon run out of hardware, right? So we need to have governance that says, well, you can have as many as you want as long as they don't last very long. We have governance that says you can stand this many up, you can use this much of our resources at any point in time. So you need to put some governance in there once you start to automate. And the final thing is once you've built your applications, you need some form of way of, of monitoring um, your applications. And that's a pretty standard journey for the customers go on. From a public cloud perspective, and we increasingly see people consuming the public cloud, the requirements are completely different. From a public cloud uh, perspective, there are three main requirements. I hear this every time I speak to a customer. The three requirements to resolve, or the three problems they have to resolve, are cost, cost, and cost. Not actually those three, but usually starts with cost. Very, very quickly followed by security, and very, very quickly followed by governance. They don't have the same operational requirements with public cloud, because public cloud has resolved many of those problems. A lot of the automation with public cloud is, is, is already built into the public cloud. When I request a, a service or I want to consume a service, I don't have to build the thing that builds that service. That's what Amazon did. They made it really, really easy for me to consume that service. That's the thing I have to do on the, the, um, this side, the left-hand side as you're looking at, if I'm building a private cloud, I have to make it very easy for people to consume those services. But the public cloud, it's already done. And then finally, for public cloud, we still have to manage our, our applications when they're operating it. 
when, when they're operating. And VMware's cloud management technology is designed to do that, to allow you to operate both from a private cloud perspective, but also from a public cloud perspective. It's got all the qualities that you need for each of those, and also to bridge those, because many applications or services don't just sit in one place. In fact, if you, if you look at a typical enterprise, their services spans everything that Ed talked about. So you take an airline, for example, their service is to move passengers and cargo from A to B. They've probably, in the private cloud or the, in the data center, got some really old systems of record and some really old um, fleet management software, etc. But on the public cloud, they're probably developing new ways to attract customers to their business. They've got new apps running. They're, they're offering ways for their consumers to interact with them a lot more and spend more money with them. So their whole service of moving passengers and cargo from A to B spans everything, and things need to talk together. Therefore, your cloud management needs to cover all those bases. So I talked earlier about um, the four Cs. Create, curate, control, and consume. Cloud management helps you do all those four Cs, and let me talk about it first, in, in, in each one in turn. How long have we got? About 10 minutes. So create. Create is when I'm building my service asset. So um, the service asset could be something very simple, like a virtual machine. It could be a three-tiered application. Or it could be a platform, like PKS or OpenShift. With create, I'm probably looking at this from a private cloud perspective. I've probably got some private cloud infrastructure. I want to create a service that I want to be able to deploy repeatedly, maybe as part of a DevOps process. So with Create, I use our Blueprint Designer to create the service. The Blueprint Designer, as you can see on here, comes in two halves. The left-hand half set there is the Visual Designer. That's where I start. I drag elements onto there, and I build up net I drag network constructs, server constructs, storage constructs. I stitch them together. And I create a definition of my service. You'll see on the right-hand side up there is the YAML as well. That's actually the, the description of that service. They work hand in hand. And actually what we find is experienced cloud architects live in YAML. They don't drag objects. They just change code. So this is where infrastructure as code becomes real. We find that in this space, people be, um, infrastructure people become infrastructure developers. They turn that infrastructure into code, and they start to treat it as code. And they store it in Git. They version control it. They do test deployments. They test it. And they, and they use that code again and again and again, and they refine that code. And this is where um, I would see a platform engineer of the future spending a lot of their time defining the services that the future pioneers are going to build their applications on and making them readily available um, as a at a storefront to allow um, developers or IT departments to deploy services at the speed they want and deploy the services that they actually want. Which leads to part two, curation. So part one was just about creating the services. Part two is about how do I make them available and what do I make available. The reason I split this into two is that um, what I described first was something you're building yourself. The reality is out in the wider world, the wider picture when you're consuming public cloud, there are probably some services that have already been created. Or, in this space, you may be creating services using different technology. I guess most of you have heard of Terraform? Yes, yeah, so Terraform could be a one, one way of describing services. You may have Terraform assets that you actually want to make available into the cloud management platform. Because most of these things that build services already, things like um, CloudFormation templates, Amazon Resource Manager templates, Terraform templates, etc., they're very good at the, the building. They're very good at the making of the thing in the place when, where you want to make the thing. But what they don't do is, going back to my previous slide, they don't provide that cost management, the governance, the security. They don't build that in. Cloud management adds those capabilities. So what if I could curate those services into one place? And as I curate them, I can start add in, adding in the missing pieces. And that is exactly what our service broker technology does. You curate. You aggregate the services from different places. The first place you aggregate them from is the ones you built yourself. The second place is you start to aggregate them from cloud. So cloud formation templates. You aggregate ARM um, templates. You might aggregate Helm charts. We've got a list of 16 places at the moment that are either already available to aggregate from or that are on our roadmap. And then on the top of that, you apply the policy and the governance. You start to apply who can do what, where can they do it, how much can they deploy, when can they deploy it, um, how long can they deploy it for, how, what's it going to be called, what security um, policies do you apply against it. 
And that is where the curation of those services comes in. It's about the platform engineer taking all those services and applying um, uh, enterprise rigor in terms of the deployment and the other things that you need to do around policy and governance. The next thing is consumption, so native cloud services. People often consider VMware, what you, uh, you come, speak to me as a VMware employee and go, surely you're frightened of the public cloud. I am so not frightened of the public cloud. The public cloud is generating more te technology conversations than we've ever had before. And we have more and more technology that can help our customers get to grip with the public cloud. So if our customers are building with these public cloud services, we have technology that can add value and help them govern how, how they're using the public cloud. Because the reality with most customers who are moving into cloud-first strategies or whatever, is it's very easy to start, but it's very hard to scale. You suddenly get that enterprise scale problem. And you suddenly realize that rather than having solutions for each of the individual clouds, wouldn't it be great if there was one management platform to manage all the things, right? Same as the run all the things platform. A horizontal platform that allows you to look holistically to everything that you own and all your assets. And that's where consumption comes into it. And finally, we have control. Control is running the things that I've got. So control can be a number of things. It could be look at network analysis using something like our Vera's network inside. We have a wavefront technology, which will allow you to um, look into how your applications are running. We have log analysis, te uh, log analysis technology, and we have costing technology to help you understand how your clouds are running. So the story being, I've created my assets. I've curated my assets and aggregate them into one. I start consuming my assets, and then I need to control how I'm running those assets. And that, in essence, is what cloud management is doing. It's a very simple story. It's a very simple narrative. It doesn't go into the technicalities of it, but the essence of cloud management is taking the things that you need to do to run those services, to make them available to developers and make them available to applications so your, cust your companies can innovate and deliver the next generation of applications or updated generations of their applications to offer more business value. So your business can go from the idea, I have a new business idea, I want to do something, to building an application to getting some business value out of that idea. And with that, I'll end with a sur summary. Uh, usually at this point, I'm putting the cameras up and take, takes a um, picture of the uh, QR code, so you can have the presentation if you want. Um, the cycling of innovation is absolutely key. Um, we have to support the cycle of innovation in all our businesses. That's the thing that keeps us going. That's the thing that keeps technology going. VMware, one platform to run all the things. It's been a mantra. It's been a hashtag for two years now, Ed. At least two years, said Ed. Maybe three, maybe ten. Long time. But VMware is one platform to run all the things. And we don't always just mean VMware. We can mean VMware technology on the public clouds, but we can actually mean the public clouds themselves. They can be VMware controlled. The platform engine of the future, um, and many, some of you will have seen me at VMUGS present the full platform engine of the future narrative. The platform engine of the future is the person who's going to be in charge is going to be in charge of running those services and aggregating and curating those services on top of those rich platforms. Um, what I'm hoping to do at VMUGS during 2020 is to talk more about the soft skills and the hard skills that you'll need um, to be that platform engine in the future. So watch out from the VMUG agendas. Uh, I've got a presentation I'll be taking out to a lot of the VMUGS um, next year. If you want to try our cloud management software, go to cloud.vmware.com. And as I say, watch out for some follow-up um, presentations from Ed and myself um, around run all the things, manage all the things, where we're going to try and really take you as um, our sponsors, our technical advocates with most of our, our customers, and really run the stuff and get the skills that you need to run all the things on a single platform and manage all the things that you're running on the platform. And with that, we're a few minutes early. We've given you some time back of five minutes. Take some questions. Um, or you can sit and wait for the next presentation. Has anyone got any questions, observations, thoughts? Can't really see very well. Silence. Rory, you must have a question. No. Stockham. Not picking on you. Robbie. Yes, question. Okay, so, so the question was, um, I didn't mention about um, VROPs and interoperability between products. That's a very good point. I'm going to very quickly go back to one slide. I'll spend two minutes on this. Um, I think what I talked about um, principally 
um, when it comes to curate, create, and consume, let's put control to one side, um, is the building and the instantiation and the governance of the things, so the services of the applications. The control bit is where VROPS comes into play, and I didn't specifically talk about it. Um, we, we slice it in a slightly different way. I wouldn't go over the slide when I was doing the presentation. But we can also slice it like this into self-driving operations, programmable provision, and application operations. So the self-driving operations part of it is how I operate it automatically. And to operate it automatically, our stuff needs to talk together. So the example being, if I'm using uh, Vera's Automation Cloud or Vera's Automation 8 to either broker stuff together using Service Broker or to build stuff using Cloud Assembly, one of the things it may need to do is talk to Vera's operations to find out where it's to deploy the stuff. You know, where, which is the cluster that's got the most capacity? Which is the cluster that's at the lowest cost based on the policy that I've defined within Vera's automation? So technology does talk together. Um, does it talk together perfectly? No, never does, software. Um, but the plans um, are that where it needs to talk together, it will talk together. Um, and our goal, really, when you see things like our separate products, Vera's operations, automation, log insight, our goal really is to help you truly have the vRealize suite as a single installable and a single product that works in concert, those three core things work in concert together. Answer the question? Good question. Thank you for the question. Seamless. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, I think we're pretty much two minutes to go, so that's good. We don't like to overrun. Um, thank you all uh, for coming. I hope you had a really good day. Um, strong advocate of VMUG. I think the VMUG UserCon's a great event. Um, strong advocate for all the VMUGs as well. So I hope to see a bunch of you at the respective VMUG chapters around the UK during the rest of the next year. Thanks very much for listening. Hope you enjoy the rest of the day and hope you all win prizes because that's why everyone stays to the end, isn't it? No? Yes. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> so thanks very much and thanks, Ed. For